Well, I have the beginning of the hour, so let's begin. Let me welcome everyone. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's host, its creator, and your guide to the next hour of conversation. Let me just set the stage a little bit here. Starting in early 2020, we at the forum started looking carefully at the COVID-19 pandemic. We hosted a series of sessions trying to understand what this might mean for higher education. And over the past two and a half years, we've continued that exploration. We've hosted technologists, we've hosted deans, we've hosted students and faculty trying to figure out how this pandemic is transforming us and what it means for the future of higher education. Today, we're absolutely lucky to have Anya Kamenetz here as a guest. Her most, she has a whole series of books, all of which are delightful and really, really useful, which I commend to you. Her most recent book, The Stolen Year, is a deep dive into what the COVID experience did to kids in the K through 12 space. Now you may say, Brian, this is a space for higher education. Well, that's a K through 12 is exactly where a lot of our students come from. So I think by talking with Anya, by reading her book, this will give us a vision into students who are starting to set foot in our campuses so we can learn a lot more about them and anticipate them. But enough about me. Let me just right now bring Anya up um, because she is the guest of honor today. So let's see if we can hit the right button and say hello to Anya. Where are you today, Anya? Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I am in my home office in Brooklyn, North awesome. Brooklyn, to be exact. How is Brooklyn today? Uh, very rainy. We had a huge cloudburst right when we were getting out the door to go to school. Very dramatic. Very dramatic. Um, well, Anya, I'm so glad you could join us. Um, it's an absolute privilege. Um, and we ask people to introduce themselves in a particular way, uh, which is to say, what are you going to be working on for the next year? What are the ideas, the topics, the projects that are going to be taking up most of your mind and time? I am so thrilled that you asked me this, and I know that we have this shared interest in common. Um, it was announced this week uh, that I'm going to be advising the Aspen Institute on a project to get more climate narratives into children's media. So oh, wow. there's going to be a task force, there's going to be some research, we're um, collecting. If you're interested in media creation, climate communication, um, nature, e education, um, uh, climate anxiety and, and climate psychology. These are all, we're going to be pulling in a lot of different disciplines to, to get this work off the ground. So super excited. Um, it's a little bit of a sidestep from my normal journalism work, although there's writing involved. Um, yeah. Wow. Well, congratulations. What a great Thanks. accomplishment. Um, and that's going to do a lot of good in the world. That's how um, so. Friends, uh, I'm just going to ask Anya a couple of basic questions to get the ball rolling. But then I want to get out of the way and let you ask questions. Uh, and I guess the first one to ask you about the stolen year is if, if, uh, if an 18 year old has lived through the past two years of the pandemic and they're just starting their first year at college or university, mm -hmm. how did the pandemic change them into a different being than an 18 year old would have been in say 2019? That's a really great question. First, we have to look at the chances that they're headed to college in the first place. I think one of the mm -hmm. most dramatic impacts of the past two years, particularly in the United States, has been the change in college enrollment, particularly first time college enrollment and particularly community college enrollment. So for our um, most successful institutions, this is a really big difference. And it is a little bit of a new animal because um, part of it has to do with the drop in, un in unemployment, the rise in wages for entry level jobs, which tends to ha have a downward pressure on college enrollment. And part of it has to do with the educational and life dislocations of the past two years. So I wanna tell you about a kid in my book I call Max. He's the oldest son of five uh, of a teacher living in rural Oklahoma. They're members of the Cherokee Nation. And with a teacher as a parent, Max was really on his way to going to college. And that was his goal. When the pandemic hit, he was faced with a choice between remote learning. His mother really didn't want him to go to school. His school did reopen in the fall of 2020, but she had a lot of safety concerns, especially with five kids total. So oh. he, re he remained remote, but he started putting in more and more hours at Chick-fil-A and he got promoted to $8 an hour. And Chick-fil-A was really taking up a lot of his time. He and 
that was the place he could go. That was a place out of his home where he was able to go, allowed to go. And unfortunately, he really drifted out of the college path. And by the time that he was graduating as a senior, his mother had to break it to him that he had lost access to the Oklahoma's Promise College Scholarship. And with it, his free ride to a four-year institution in the state. Um, so he is uh, working right now, um, going taking some classes part-time, and uh, it's not really clear exactly what where his path is going to end up. Wow. So that's one key issue that uh, just enrollment overall is down and COVID has helped um, break access to higher ed. Um, for those who do come, uh, I, I've, I've heard faculty who are concerned that students will be more anxious or have other uh, psychological stresses. I've heard, uh, I've heard faculty worry that students will be less academically well prepared. Uh, and I've heard faculty worry that students are just going to be less socially prepared. That they missed a few years of face-to-face -face socialization. Is, is all of this is all this true? Is that should we expect all that? Um, I think it's I think it's uh, it's all supported by the data. Um, this question of missed socialization is maybe not something we were used to hearing about when it came to typically developing young adults, right? Net, or children even, even children above. You know, you start thinking about, you think about socializing your toddlers and your young children. You don't really think about the socialization that happens increasingly with peers, right? In different situations. And that's exactly what we're hearing now, that there's behavior loss or there's social emotional loss along with the learning loss. Um, so the question is, how do we, how do institutions meet those challenges, right? I think that's, you know, it's very supported by the evidence. We're hearing a lot from young people who say that they're plagued by these concerns. Um, there's a, you know, total removal of stigma for talking about mental health um, in this generation, which I think is a positive in a lot of ways. The question mm -hmm. is, how do institutions respond? Do you think this means that institutions that teach traditional age undergraduates are going to have a lot more work to do in terms of their socialization mission? Um, yes, I think I think it requires thinking creatively about the role that you play within um, a young person's life and their journey. Uh, you know, we really do place a lot of emphasis, especially in the United States, on college as a rite of passage and a way that we, you know, people go along the path to adulthood. From in my mind, you know, part of the recovery from the pandemic involves recognizing the untraditional milestones that students may have achieved during this time. You know, they may have seen loss and grief and, and confronted it in a way that other generations had not. They may have spent more time at home and, and be in, in intergenerational settings rather than with their peers. What are the strengths in that? And so how do colleges kind of situate themselves in their young person's journey, knowing that an 18 year old in 2022 might be really different from one in 2020 or any other year? Wow, unconventional milestones, like surviving a family member being ill or themselves getting COVID. Um, wow, that really does change the social situation. Um, what, what else should colleges and universities do to better prepare for these students, to support them? Um, so meeting students where they're at can sometimes involve rethinking the way that we do school by predictable levels of expectations. I mean, one thing that students experience when they were remote is control over their time and their space in a way that we don't always offer to college students. Some colleges are extremely flexible and really, you know, do it as you want. Other colleges have a lot of time and place and behavior expectations for, for students, and that really varies a lot. So mm -hmm. kind of not taking any of that for granted and saying, well, you know, Faculty members learned how to do things totally differently during the pandemic, and, and some of it worked well, some of it didn't. So can we rethink of our, you know, our procedures and our expectations that we're placing on students and kind of work with them to bring them up? Maybe you would say, you know, maybe you're doing classes in a way that allows students to speak to each other more often. Maybe they have less in-person time that they're expected to be there just to listen to a lecture, but they are have more time that they're expected to be out in the community and working on projects together. So how can sure. that really serve the students' needs? I'm, I'm curious, over, over the past six and a half years, we've, we've talked about how to teach well online and yeah. in many, many ways. And, and one of the divides is, should uh, online education spend more time doing what we're doing now, synchronous, often video, uh, or more asynchronous, 
uh, such as discussion boards, email, the LMS, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I just, just a, this is a big, big, gross question. Sorry. Just thinking about the COVID generation coming to campus. Mm -hmm. Do you think they would benefit more from synchronous discussion work or more from asynchronous online work? I feel like that's kind of a tools question. And what we really need to ask mm -hmm. is what is the strategy and the, and the overall goal? And like in an ideal world, I'd like to see students enlisted in the kind of strategic thinking that takes place mm -hmm. so, so that they can kind of say, and I think for me, you know, for me as an adult now with control over my space and my time, I have the luxury of sitting back and saying, could this meeting be an email? Do I really need to show up to this Zoom? Or actually, do I need to come and talk to Brian in person to cement our relationship? Or is there something, some other activity that we ought to be doing that can bring our learning forward into a new direction? You know, and, and as a person in the world, I like literally ask those questions every day. Do I need to show up there? Yep. Is there a new experience I could be having that is so compelling that it has to be in person? If not, I would rather slack you, you know? <laughs> so- I know that feeling. So, so in other words, can so can students can can instructional designers and students and professors think yeah. about what the goals are and can, can you work backwards from the goals to the medium or the model and then i think you know you're probably going to be asked to offer the same course in multiple modes either simultaneously or sequentially anyway because those are that's what students are conditioned to demand well, thank you. That's a great, great answer. And I love how it, it takes the students into a position of strategy and reflection and, and power. Um, we have, let, let me stop interrogating you because I want to make sure that everybody gets a chance. And friends, the forum is here for you. So again, please just reach down to the uh, Q&A button, the question mark button to type in your queue, uh, or hit the uh, raised hand button if you want to join us on stage. Uh, I promise that we will be as kind as we possibly can be. Um, and a couple of questions have already come up. One is a two-parter, and this is from our good friend, Nate Angel. Uh, so let me just read one part after another. So the first part is, I, I follow Anya's work pretty closely, but haven't read the stolen year yet. I see strong evidence that the edu way education was provided during the pandemic has not served learners well. But, and here's the second part, I also see evidence the pandemic was not handled well. It's a public health crisis. How could both of these issues have been handled better? So both education and the pandemic as a whole. Yeah, yeah. So we're really gonna we're gonna go in the way back machine here. Um, yeah. I think there's a lot to be so. This was a once in a century, perhaps once in a millennium type of challenge, and nobody's going to respond perfectly. Um, many countries took very different paths, and it didn't seem that the level of money that you have in your society, or the level of scientific or technological sophistication in your society was a deciding factor in who was successful. There were factors of geography, factors of demography, certainly. Um, but from, you know, the countries that quote unquote won the pandemic, South Korea, we can say Vietnam, New Zealand, right? These are countries, Japan, that had um, seemed to have a high degree of social trust, some experience that was relevant. Um, and then, you know, two of those in there are islands. So, um, so a little bit of that is luck, but, you know, for, for America's response to the pandemic, we have to highlight the incredible battering that our social trust took, especially over the several years leading up to the pandemic, the attacks on institutions and sources of expertise, right? This is a thing of, of great relevance to people in the academy. And, um, although we had incredible scientific and technological expertise that allowed us to get at a running sprint to a vaccine in a way that the world had never seen. And a lot of that is credited to America. Um, we weren't able to do these other things that seem so important. And, and honestly, a lot of those failures are failures of education. They're failures of public education. They're failures of, commu of communicating messages to people in a way that is trustworthy and simple and honest, and is honest and clear about the fact that our knowledge of the virus is changing at the same time. And we seem to be having a very, very hard time keeping up with that knowledge. Um, but I, I don't want to editorialize. That was a great question, Nate. Um, yeah. And uh, Anya, I bet, is going to keep whacking at that question for the rest of this hour at different points. Um, the, uh, we have a, a question um, that came in from a lot of strategic questions. Uh, and here's one from, uh, uh, from our friend Tom Hames, who asks, if you can come back to your previous point, can you address the particular decline among college community colleges? Yeah, that's such a great question. And um, 
I, I want to bring not I don't know the context that everyone well, I heard that most people are here from the US. I was giving an, a, a, a presentation in Canada and was astonished to realize that they have not experienced this decline mm -hmm. um, that we have. And, and we have this very dramatic decline. And I think that's important when you think about community colleges, because, you know, Canada has a very, you know, public heavy and affordable to the public system. Um, and that is what our community colleges are meant to offer. So when we're thinking about community college enrollment decline, um, it, it is, uh, you know, part of it has to do with the changes in the employment market, but those have been seen in Canada as well, um, a tighter employment market. Mm -hmm. Although, I mean, part of our tightening in the employment market has to do with, honestly, the people that died, right? There's, there's, a, there's a high, very high death rate in the United States. Most of those people weren't working age, but we still have people that are, you know, have, have died and people that sub also can't work because of long COVID. Um, so there are people who say, for the moment, I would rather work. But then I think we can't discount this point of uh, dislocation in life course, right? And how people think about and plan their futures. And, you know, what I heard from so many people who were finishing up high school during the pandemic, which was the loss of those milestones and the loss of the ability to plan and to set goals. Um, so I think it's a massive challenge. I mean, we already had a very large, some college no degree and dropout, stopout population, adult mm -hmm. learners. We're going to have more. I mean, optimistically, we're going to have more of them. And that's where the, the college um, going is going to increase from in the coming years. And I hope that happens with the Inflation Reduction Act and new green jobs being created. Um, there's one other factor that I would mention, and that would be the downturn in immigration during the pandemic, mm -hmm. which probably is a big factor, especially in large cities. Well, and, and you and you nailed that with uh, with Tom because Tom lives in the Houston area, yeah, uh, which is definitely a large large city and definitely one for whom uh, uh, you know immigration plays a, a, a major role. Yeah. Um, well, Tom, thank you for the really good question, and Anya, I appreciate your your deep dive into that. We have more questions coming up, and friends, uh, again, this is a place for you to ask your questions, uh, and one comes from our good friend Kiel Dunge. Uh, Kiel asks about um, the loan forgiveness plan. What do you think about the Biden loan forgiveness plan? It doesn't exist to underline cost problems, which in his view are largely caused by higher ed's credential monopoly. So what do you think about this? I think that the student loan forgiveness plan is best understood as an absolute triumph of organizing over mm. many, many years by dedicated people who saw this as a area where they could change the meaning of, of student debt and the bargain that had been offered to generations of students. Um, it serves as targeted, racially targeted and economically targeted correctly, uh, relief for the middle class and working class in America. Um, it, it represents something that Biden could do with the stroke of a pen to change material nature of people's lives in this country. It does not change the uh, fundamental economics of higher education costs in this country. It is a one-time write-off, right? Might it put some caution into uh, the, the higher education system that is the beneficiary of our debt financed tuition scheme in America? Maybe, maybe not. I mean, they have a lot of other pressures and a lot of other things to think about. Are, are we going to see state universities following, you know, Purdue to say, like, we're going to hold tuition down because we are not sure if this, these loans are going to be. I mean, colleges didn't don't hurt from this loan forgiveness. This is just the education department, just the federal government. So. In some ways, the signal there's not a clear signal being sent to the marketplace in in the tuition realm, and so it's it's not almost not even best seen as a higher education intervention as much as it is, like I said, wealth oh. for the middle class. Hmm. hmm. Well, that's an interesting take on it, uh, Kiel. I know you have a lot of thoughts about this. If uh, if you'd like to say more, either if you want to uh, join us on stage, if your camera or mic are up, but otherwise, just uh, give us a, another Q and A box entry. Thank you for the great question and. Oh, yeah, thank you for that really, really thoughtful answer. Well, you know, um, I've been thinking yeah. about this since 2006. So it's like it was it's wild to see. Because you have a great book called Generation Debt. Uh, and this is so important. Yeah. And, and I appreciate your uh, celebrating the organizers. Um, we have uh, more questions that are just piling up now, which is just great. And again, friends, if you haven't had a chance to grab uh, this new book by Anya Kamenetz, on the bottom left of your screen, there should be a kind of, well, there it is. There's a visual aid right there. And you should have a link uh, on the screen on the on the bottom left where you can just go and grab a copy um, oh, cool. because it's an important important book for our time. 
Uh, so here's another question coming from Lonnie Morrison. Should we be looking at this period as a permanent change in the educational paradigm so that Stone will be more in control, sorry, students will be more in control of how and where they learn, i.e. the industrial tech and information revolution? Let me, let me flash up on the screen again, because that's, that's a really good question. So is this a permanent change in education? I see it as an accelerant to changes underway and the kinds mm -hmm. of changes that Brian has been writing about and talking about and leading discussions about for a long time. Mm -hmm. Universities knew that they could do what they did in March 2020, and many of them had a lot of reasons why they didn't want to. And then they all had to do it. So now that they've all done it, we know that they can do it. So are we going to make them keep doing it? That's the question. And does emergency remote learning, how much, what lessons does it offer and does it not offer to the transformation in educational offerings? I think there's a sense memory involved in, in having this experience and people have positive and negative, but they know that, you know, ultimately being able to access a full college degree program anytime, anywhere is a huge boon. And so they're going to have more demand for it, I think, in the future. In, in the chat, a few people have been saying this, that students will want this, that, um, yeah. that there's a convenience. Um, do you think universities and colleges will listen? I mean, we have a lot invested in face-to-face -face education. Um, I think the process that's been happening is going to keep happening, that, you know, there's going to continue to be winners in online and winners in traditional. And there will also be people who do neither successfully. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> yes, yes, quite. Um, well, thank you. That's, that's a great question, uh, Lonnie. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, uh, one of the great things about have, about uh, hosting a, a journalist is the journalist can can fly up with tons of great, great answers in a hurry uh, and really give us a lot to think about, which is wonderful. Uh, we have another question that's kind of related to this, Sonia, uh, from Chelsea uh, Glazen. Uh, and Chelsea asks, put this up on the stage, uh, do you anticipate a movement in accessibility uh, within the universal design framework as we move towards a more remote-centered workplace and online coursework? That's a great question. It is. I would say that awareness of disability and the benefits of accessibility has grown a lot during the pandemic because there was a certain leveling of the playing field in the move to remote work as well as remote school. Um, and a broader conversation about inclusiveness and diversity in our society, you know, in, in, in the fall, you know, intensifying in 2020. So, I think there's reason to hope for that, and particularly because universal accessibility design principles are beneficial to everyone. That's the idea. That, like, like the, I think the, the famous example is a, a curb cut, uh, yeah. which is great for people with rollers or walkers or canes or wheelchairs, but also great for people with bicycles or just people walking. Um, so hopefully, hopefully this will be a big push for UDL. Um, yeah. Well, that's a great answer. And Chelsea, uh, thank you for a really, really good question along those lines. Mm -hmm. uh, the, Anya, you are becoming, I think, for people today, uh, a kind of oracle uh, for higher education, education as a whole. So these questions are coming from all directions. Here, right. Here's another one that covers, this is from uh, uh, Rob Gibson. And hello, Rob. Uh, this is a question about uh, Kansas. Uh, based on recent events in Emporia State University and the firing of 33 tenure track faculty, is tenure doomed? Um, we're in a cycle of right-wing culture war attacks on educational institutions and educational expertise, which are multi-front attacks. They include attacks against content of learning um, in K-12 and higher ed, how professors and teachers conduct themselves out of the classroom, as well as these budget-based attacks. Um, interestingly, we're in, in the current situation that we're in, oddly enough, we're seeing Republican governors raise teacher pay in K-12, which is a surprising Ooh. thing that's happening in a couple places, including in Florida. Um, but uh, I don't think that tenure per se is doomed. I think that the major, um, the major danger to how uh, students are taught and how uh, universities are staffed is the Capital is the increasing casualization of academic labor. So over a long period of time, yes, 
like adjunctification is here and it's not going anywhere and it's getting worse and worse in some ways. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there a counterweight to that in unionization in, you know, or is it going to be a victim of con of consolidation? I, I don't know what the ultimate outcome is going to be, but I know that the end of 10 years has been forecast for at least 50 years. That's true. It's true. And it has been declining as a proportion for you know, roughly 30. Um, uh, it's a good question. Uh, thank you, Rob. And uh, Anya, I admire your ability to pivot and uh, turn to that question because there's a lot going on there. Um, yeah. uh, we had a question from Kiel and Kiel has just followed up. Uh, he asks, um, please get Anya's view on alternative credentialing and skills-based hiring's potential to break the four-year degree monopoly and dramatically lower higher ed costs. Alternative credentialing and skills-based hiring. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I do want to add on to what's been being said in the chat box. I think it's really important as well to note that there are innovative, newer institutions that are changing the role of the faculty, sometimes splitting up the role of the faculty into success coaches and subject matter mm -hmm. experts yeah. and, you know, kind of the blend of the student services um, office along with faculty-based office to make sure that, you know, the ultimate goal here is that students succeed. They have a, someone who cares about them and, and, and wants their success that seems to know them well. Um, and so whether that's coaches, if it's someone in the enrollment, you know, there's, there's a lot of different people who can help that happen. It doesn't have to always be a tenure track faculty members that, that does it. Often it's not. Um, so, well, yeah. Well, uh, well, first, thanks for going into the in, into the chat there. Uh, along those lines, uh, our dear friend Sarah San Gregorio says, if she has to answer one more email on the ambiguous now buzzword <laughs> importance of student engagement, I'm going to scream. Mm -hmm. I think one of the better part of a quick move to online during COVID was that it was more about relationships than content. And that, that wasn't a question, but I thought that's a great comment. I just wanted to float that past you. Does that, does that match your understanding of this? I saw the very same thing in K-12. Um, there were online mm -hmm. schools, schools when they went remote that were successful because of their pre-existing investment in student relationships. Mm -hmm. I, I feel her pain with the buzzword stuff, mm -hmm. but I also know that there's intentional design of schools and even um, school support, you know, inside outside school models that can foster that kind of relationship. When you make a person, a coach, a mentor, or a teacher responsible for the success of a student and align, that's aligned with their professional goals, they're going to be recognized for that. They're going to be rewarded for that alongside or, in, you know, instead of other duties, then you are setting students up for success. So that I've seen it happen in a lot of different kinds of ways. So that takes resources um, and also the decision to support that. Yes, that's right. It takes deployment of resources. It doesn't necessarily take a bunch of new resources. Um, it just depends on how you use them. Mm -hmm. No, that's a good point. That's a good um, point. So the question on internal, eternal, alternative credentialing and skills-based hiring. Yeah, you know, I've been, I've been hearing about, well, first of all, there's a lot of alternative credentials out there. There are, and community colleges are a very great place to have them. There are technical certificates and they're, they're constantly being updated and, and all the time. Um, in some ways, to me, the proliferation of so many alternatives does less to challenge the good old four-year BA than it would if there were fewer options because it's almost, it's like the seven dwarves, you know, like there's, you know, it's hard for them to add up to something that's as big and as easy to understand and as traditional as the four-year BA. And that's nothing against dwarves. Well, that's, that's okay. I mean, I, I, I do look a bit like a classic dwarf here, uh, at least in the <laughs> mythical fantasy sense. But, that, but, that's, but that's interesting. I mean, so it, it may be that that's a, a marginal or a, a niche function of higher ed, but um, if, Kiel, uh, let me see if I can ventriloquize you a little bit here. Um, mm -hmm. Looking at the K through 12 side, uh, I mean, is K through 12, generally speaking, still committed to getting a lot of students out the high school door into a baccalaureate degree? Or is there any appetite or any uh, appetite in K through 12 for getting students into some kind of alternative credential, be it a certificate or micro credential? Um, as there is a lot of energy on the institutional level for moving students down the chain to the next institution. That is how college, that's how high schools are set up. Mm -hmm. And it's how they make their name. 
right? You make your name by the pennants that are on the door of the counselor's office. Whether you are, you know, a, a, a public school or a private school, that's kind of how it's done. So getting to the point where you can say, well, I had a student who started a business and I had a student who was a contestant on a reality show. I had a student who moved to Alaska and, and started homesteading and we celebrate those paths as well. That takes a little bit of courage, a little bit of vision, and it takes a little bit more time to explain what, what that looks like. We don't have, and I, I actually completely agree that, you know, centralization and formalization, that's almost anathema to what we're talking about because we're talking about people having more choices and more paths, but it's harder, you know, but but the pressure, there is pressure coming from the student side because students do have access to see different kinds of life paths mm -hmm. and figuring, helping them figure out how they can see those other paths and, you know, and, and, and then they'll be pushing the schools to give them what they need to get there. I wonder if social media helps play a role in that just because it makes uh, alternative life paths so much more visible, so much more accessible. I think it can. You know, I was just talking uh, with Abby Felix. She started the the nonprofit Global Citizen Year as Ooh. sort of an intentional way of promoting the gap year idea, which was seen as sort of a privileged thing. But, you know, there's no, you know, there's also AmeriCorps and there's national service programs. Ooh. You know, the, the biggest thing the federal government could do would be to create a national service program to help us okay. transition to green energy and to help these kids find a way into communal life again. Um that they may have missed at, at anyone can take this idea. This is free. It's not original either, but, but, you know, and then, and then you could say, well, are you going to college? No. Are you going to the army? No, I'm going in the civilian conservation corps. Which I love. I, I, this is just uh, a, a huge opportunity for that right now. Uh, and I think it would be, and we have precedents for it in American history and it, it wouldn't be that hard to do. I believe that it was a an early demand of the Sunrise Movement in the Green New Deal. Mm -hmm. They being young people themselves saying, we'd love yep. to be able to work in this in this direction. Yep, yep. yep. Um, haven't seen it yet, but maybe there's still time. Um, yeah. We have more questions coming in. And friends, you can tell that uh, uh, that Anya is, is a dynamo answerer. And so please bring up your questions. And if you want to join us on stage, uh, mm -hmm. again, just hit the raise hand button uh, and we would like to talk. Uh, we have a question here from Rachel Gock. I hope I mispronounced. I hope pronounced it correctly. And let me bring that question up on the screen for us all, which is how can elite or well-funded private institutions advocate or be good partners for their neighbor community colleges? Yeah, that is a really good question. I recall some minimal attempts to do this when I was at Yale between Yale and Gateway Community College, which yeah. is very close yeah. to us. Um, I think that there's definitely opportunities to do knowledge sharing and knowledge transfer as long as you understand that it's not a one-way knowledge transfer that community colleges often have the edge when it comes to integrating with local workforce needs and institutions as well as the communities that they're they're embedded in so how can that be a two-way knowledge transfer a knowledge and culture transfer and can it be something where there's hands-on learning involved or you know professors travel from one to the other or students are able to create their own um, collaborations well, that would be great. That would be okay. great. Uh, and that's not something that's blazingly new. That's something that we could do. Yeah. And uh, I think when it comes to climate change, this is one of the areas where we can have a lot of climate partnerships on those levels. Yeah. Great question, Rachel. Thank you. Uh, and uh, friends, we have uh, we have time for more of your questions and comments. And I'd, I'd like you to uh, feel free to uh, to share yours. Uh, I'd like to put out one question um, based on, on your book directly, Anya. Um, I'm wondering about how to support the mental health of these students who have gone through a wide range of traumas. Uh, and and this, is a, this is a generation that's going to be entering higher education for the next 10 years. Um, and, you know, thinking about first graders, thinking about eighth graders who have gone through two plus years of sickness, injury, death, economic devastation, political chaos. And I, I'm thinking about colleges and universities and we're not always the most um, humane. Um, and I, I'm wondering how, what can, what can we do to just better provide for the mental health of these students? Do we need to train our faculty to be able to do that? Should we just expand our psychologists on staff? Is there a technological solution? What do you think? I love this question. And it's been something I've been giving a lot of presentations about. 
in the book, I sort of talk about a couple different paradigms. So first of all, I think it's really important to underline what you're saying, which is that is not this is not a next couple of years problem. This is a next decade and a half problem. Um, there's a great documentary out called Katrina Babies about mm -hmm. the generation that I and I write about this in the book that, you know, going through Katrina as a young reporter and from New Orleans and seeing the impact on kids 10 years later and then now 15 years later, 17 years later. Um, and they're, you know, kids and the people they grew up to have children and then those kids. Um, so I, I honestly think that the best, I mean, yes, we need more mental health practitioners. Yes, there is a role for social and emotional awareness. Um, I would like to put in a plug for something I found about recently called Mental Health First Aid, um, which is an eight hour training that anyone who deals with young people can take. And it empowers you to be a first responder to someone in a various kinds of mental health crises. And it's supported by peer-reviewed evidence. So check it out. Um, so, but I, I honestly think that the, the, the disciplines and the scholarship that university professors work on can itself be of help because there is a need, young people who are moving past a difficulty in their lives really need a strengths-based approach. They need people who can see them as strong, empowered people who got through something tough and are capable of learning and growing and having a new perspective on what they went through. That is who these kids are. And we get them there through whatever discipline it is that you love, that they are then empowered to excel in by engaging with that discipline. I mean, I'm, I have a soft spot for the humanities, so I would say do it with poetry, do it with literature, do it with history, the history of incredible challenges that people have faced, but you can do it with biology, you can do it with ecology. And, sure. you know, and, and connecting and inspiring young people, that's, that's, the, that's the number one job, right? Being their therapist, being their counselor is not your, is not your number one job, but connecting with and inspiring them, that is the number one job for faculty members. Thank you. Thank you. That's a, that's a really great answer. And I, I yeah, this is going to be a long term thing. Um, we have uh, more questions coming in, which is great. Uh, and, and as usual, I, I should say on you, several people wrote in to say you have, you're, that they're fans of yours uh, and they've been reading you for a while. And, uh, and here comes another one. Uh, we have uh, Nate Angel who uh, refers to your most recent experience. Uh, he asks, did you see any parallels between what you saw in education while you were in Ukraine, reporting there in the war, and what you saw in the pandemic in the U.S.? Yeah. Hi, Nate. It's also nice, always nice to connect, connect with you on Twitter, and thanks for showing up here. Um, yes, definitely. I mean, concretely, Ukraine pivoted its children to remote learning immediately when the crisis happened. Um, and I was able in, I believe, April of or maybe March of 2020, 2022, to drop in on a Google Meet classroom that was meeting with the Ukrainian teacher who had come to Western Ukraine with mm -hmm. her students who were in Poland and Germany and some of them back home under bombardment on their phones and they're having an mm -hmm. English lesson together, a group of sixth graders. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, it's both, it's awe inspiring, it's, it's terrifying, it's very, very sad. Um, the war has directly attacked educational infrastructure in the country, it's also displaced, um, I think two thirds of the nation's kids, either inside or outside the country. So there is an incredible burden, an incredible dis disbursement, diaspora of people um, who have educational needs, including wives and mothers who are displaced, who need new education so they can work in their new context, as well as a huge language learning need for, for the displaced populations. Um, and then the need to kind of rebuild the country if eventually they come back in peace. So um, the disruption is, it's disruption on top of disruption. It's hard to compare because they had the COVID disruption and then they had the war disruption and they had some of the tools and practices were able to be repurposed from one to the other. But the overarching question is like, is this the new normal? Do we just try to accustom ourselves as a society to have an incredibly huge disruption for large numbers of every population every single year? What about if you, you know, university students in Pakistan, There's there has been a whole thing about university students dispersed from Syria. Um, so... Puerto yeah, Rico. Puerto Rico, absolutely right. So, and Puerto Rico's school system received a huge shock with Maria that it really hasn't fully recovered from, and and part of that shock was a privatization shock, similar to Katrina. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, this is this is keeping happening. Online is important to have as an emergency measure, um, and the kind of planning that we need to do in a society that is marked by this kind of instability 
boggles the mind. But when you think about the people that started the university system in medieval Europe without in the year 1000, I mean, they kind of had similar problems, but they didn't have the internet. So maybe we can take some inspiration. I think we can. And thank you. Thank you. Um, good question. Uh, and uh, friends, I want to bring up a, a very special video guest. Uh, this is uh, Steve Gottlieb, who is the founder and leader of Shindig himself. And he has a question about Zoom pedagogy and how we've been doing video, a video wrong versus how to do it right. So let me bring Steve up on stage. Hey, Hello, sir. Hi. Hi, Anya. Uh, great to see you. Thanks for having uh, me. Um, so I was struck by your comments uh, not so long ago on Michael Horn's podcast about uh, the damage uh, that followed Katrina. And uh, in light of that, also the recent articles in the Times and the, and the Wall Street Journal about the plummeting test scores uh, based on the uh, two new studies that came out um, that you know really condemned uh, virtual school on on Zoom uh, for you know having produced very poor results. Um, and you know, I, I wanted to get your thoughts on both the why of that, why you think test scores dr so dramatically uh, 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 fell, um, which seems to, be, you know, and also whether the wholesale embrace by academia of Zoom, which has a lot of technical limitations. You can't privately chat with uh, fellow students. Uh, the teacher can't circulate easily around the class to give individualized attention. Uh, um, all the things that Shindig does, uh, if I could give a plug. But, um, you know, that that um, architecture of Zoom and its wholesale embrace is part of the cause for that, um, the failure uh, of pandemic classes and, and uh, that the academy really needs to rethink its, you know, its kind of... Uh, uh, um, embrace of a of a oversimplified classroom model that doesn't allow a lot of different class dynamics. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, that's a, that's a complex and multi layered question. Thank you for that. Um, I think that the the main reasons that Zoom school failed in K twelve doesn't have much to do with Zoom. So there were a lot of problems on the other side of the screen. There was insufficient connectivity, under connectivity, lack of devices, lack of a quiet room to be in, lack of an adult supervision. And mental health professionals who reached out to me early on in the pandemic just pointed out that there is just for, for children, you know, they progress through a very concrete, you know, tactile stage of learning. As a baby, they are putting everything in their mouth. And, and then they're you know, they're growing through stages of, of, of learning physically in a room. And there are many, many benefits for young children through all the way through grade school of having physical, you know, added on lesson plans, which you don't always take full advantage of, but we want to have that there. And there's also this factor that we often take for granted or try to limit, which is children learning, being motivated to learn by being surrounded by their peers. And that can have a positive and negative impact. It's quite complex, but they're motivated by their teachers and the relationship with their teachers. And Access to all of that was very limited during the pandemic. It was a very low number of kids who had the executive function, the internal motivation, and or the adult Sherpa person with them all the time to keep them motivated into school. It was so, and, and another teacher said it to me the best, that it was the end of compulsory schooling because hmm. now, you know, you there are not that many kids. There are kids who will stand up and walk right out of your classroom. There's a percentage of kids that will do that. There will a percentage of kids who will passively resist everything you say. But in, in Zoom school, walking out of the classroom is clicking over to a tab where there's YouTube. So it's way, way easier. And given that removal of friction, you had a lot of kids who passively played truant, including many kids that I know, <laughs> um, for weeks on end, right? And so these are pretty tough problems for any software platform to solve. Um, that doesn't mean that we can't imagine there, there, there were kids that th thrived and they thrived because of the removal of the distractions in the classroom. They thrived because the classroom is a hostile place for them, you know, not, not a beneficial place. Um, they thrive because of the control over their environment that they are, were encouraged or coached to use in a positive way. 
So, and then there are kids who, you know, there are a lot of kids who can't physically go to school or be through, be physically in a whole school day, right? So can we make online learning work for some kids in K-12 with the right kind of design, pedagogical design, the right kind of instructional support? And I would agree with you, part of that, that successful, I think yes. And I would agree with you that that successful model might include a platform that allows for easier interaction and invites teachers to use more interactive classroom models. Um, um, I wonder, you know, I, I appreciate that the, that the question is very complex um, and does involve all those different modalities. Um, but I, I do wonder why there is not more self-examination amongst academia about, um, you know, there used to be in my early, you know, years in dealing with online education, peer-to-peer -peer education was a big, big buzzword pre-pandemic. Then, you know, Zoom class hit and peer-to-peer, -peer, you know, engagement was not, a, a, you know, everything had to be public. And there is an erosion of the ability to create trust when and to be open to vulnerability, to show weakness when everything has to be done in front of the entire class and there's no ability to get reassurance or, or uh, 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 counsel and help uh, and all the rest that comes from both peer to peer, uh, uh, knowing that other people are similarly situated or teacher intervention. And I wonder why there isn't more soul searching among ac academia because now you hear them, you know, uh, New York school system, you know, a a as others, are continuing on with virtual Zoom classes as if uh, there was no problem, as if there was no deficiency in the provision of online education that happened in the pandemic, and it was just the best that could be done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's a very it's hard because there wasn't a deliberative process leading up to the pivot, right? And so going back now and trying to and now people might be comfortable with the path that they've chosen. So there's some path dependency to it as well. well that's a good point. Really Thanks so much for great work. Really. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. And thank you, Steve, for Shindig, as well as for being yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's an example of a video question. And we have another video uh, question that's coming up. Um, and this is from uh, uh, Tom Hames, who is back in his famous blue room. Uh, and he's had a couple of questions, and I just want to bring him on stage on you because his questions are always so deep. Um, and uh, here we go, Tom. Hi there. Um, so just a quick comment on what Steve was saying, though. Um, you know, one of the common mistakes we make about pandemic, the pandemic and how we reacted to it re remote teaching is to focus on the technology. And that's not really the question here. It's a uh, and, and I wanted to get your response on a, a deeper question of, um, I feel like the pandemic broke communities in a lot of ways because uh, communities of learning in particular, and that this was a big underlying factor in um, how people were able to succeed or not in these environments. And, and people didn't think that this was the problem. And we lost a lot of informal learning that, you know, we didn't recognize as being how important that was to that process. Uh, you know, people just running into each other in the hall, sitting around in the library, cafeteria, whatever, talking about what was just talked about in class or or studying together and all those sorts of, those things evaporated in, in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. Also, people were isolated physically from each other. And that, that's a problem, too. Mm -hmm. That's not Zoom's fault. That's not the platform's fault. I think that a lot of that has to do with people understanding that how to use the technology. And I think you can use Zoom badly and I think you can use Zoom well. I mean, I, I, I do a lot of individual meetings with my students now that I didn't do in, a, in the same way because it's so the frictionless ability to just pull up a Zoom window and meet with somebody. Right. Uh, and so that, you know, that was a big shift that I did when I went to remote teaching. I mean, I already been trying to go to, I mean, I, I really focus on individualized instruction a lot. And I, and I, yeah. you know, I wrote a book about my experience with that as well. But, um, but I wanted to get your feeling on this lack of community, uh, especially among vul more vulnerable students. I think the more advanced learners are able to learn much more, although they're, they definitely are helped with, with an active community. Mm -hmm. I think more advanced learners are able to learn more independently uh, without 
you know, on their own. Whereas more vulnerable students really need people to be around them, both peers and support personnel to help them through that process. And I wanted to know if, what your thoughts were on that gets kind of relates back to my earlier question about community colleges, because they tend to attract those more vulnerable learners. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's an important observation. I mean, I guess I might soften, soften your observation a little bit to say that it, the pandemic tested communities yeah. and many communities found that they, they broke apart or they fell short or they found new divisions or things that were easier to smooth over face to face were very hard to resolve mm -hmm. um, in other forms of communication. But I also found that, you know, both personally and professionally for me, being very intentional about how I connected with people and connecting with them mm -hmm. um, consistently in gatherings like this one, Brian, helped me feel like I had community. And when the pandemic emerged and we could see each other in person again, I felt the strengths of those connections. I felt that they were real. And so what the what the pandemic challenges to do, and certainly this is not the only event that's gonna make people feel <laughs> divided yeah. or apart from each other, um, it challenges us to be really intentional about how we build community and and with whom and who, who are we including, who are we not including. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That was a lesson from New Orleans too, wasn't it? From Katrina? Yes, absolutely. Um, and that was something I experienced for firsthand because while there was outside intervention of various kinds, there was also an incredible explosion of mutual aid. And mm -hmm. people developed muscles that, you know, th that was also based on a substrate. So there's, you know, there's mutual aid and pleasure clubs in New Orleans are part of the fabric of the city. And they were started as burial societies. And the, sec the famous mm -hmm. second lines, all right, are... Those are people coming together, bringing a little money together so that they can bury their dead. And so um, people have that cultural memory that comes up. And when they need each other, they know how to find each other again. Yeah. And it also exploded that community. I mean, we, we saw the the uh, the shrapnel from that in Houston. Uh, you know, our yep. our percentage of people who are connected to New Orleans in some way went up dramatically. Yes. Uh, after Katrina. And. I, I would I think that that's actually in some ways uh, a, a, both a good and a bad byproduct. I mean, it's a good byproduct because it brings those communities closer together, but it's a bad byproduct from the New Orleans core because they lost a lot of people. And, and that's scattered I mean, that's, the universe. Yeah, that's yeah. the point is of an exile or a diaspora. That's exactly what the people yeah. in Ukraine are experiencing now. There's the yeah. the feeling that, you know, the, the community experience in the faraway place, the memory of the home place, the people at home who lost and the people who are far away and miss their home. And so it's, it's a big part of the human condition. Right. right. Of course, COVID, with COVID, we exploded and didn't go anywhere. Yes. That's that's what's so totally we were re yeah. inter internal refugees, to quote an yes. old German historical co term from the, from the Nazi period. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> right. That's exactly right. Konrad Adenauer. Sorry, uh, yeah. what am I doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and stay safe there. Thank you. Um, we had uh, a, a time for one last observation and one quick question. The observation is from uh, the splendid George Station. Uh, and he reminds us that um, two years of the pandemic and Zoom made visible it was already a deficiency of classroom teaching, um, which I, I thought was just an excellent, excellent way of putting this. Yeah. Um, I, I guess I, I have time. I'll take the moderator's privilege and ask one last question of my own uh, before we have to go. Um, and that is, what what have we learned from this experience of, of COVID education that we can apply to the experience of education during the climate pen, the climate crisis? That's a great question. Um, well, we keep being reshown until we learn that the structures of inequality in our society are going to determine the fates of people more so than any disaster to come because they're the underlying landscape, right? And so any attempt to recover from any disaster or to shore up our responses to the next one has to be informed by our understanding of the underlying inequities and in our attempts to redress those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And that's going to be the first step in many ways, if we do it right. Uh, Anya, we can only do it right with your help. Thank you so much for being a fantastic guest. Um, I, I just, it's, it's wonderful to be with you. What's, what's the best way to keep up with you and your work? Should we follow you on Twitter or should we? Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, I think that would be the easiest. I I'm, I'm, I send in a monthly newsletter as well, but you can find linked at my bio on Twitter, which is Anya Wen Anya. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, in the meantime, good luck with this uh, new uh, media production uh, of the climate crisis for uh, uh, for kids. And congratulations once more on this newest book, uh, which is so, I think, so vital for everything we're doing. Uh, and above all, thank you for being a great guest on the program. We're looking forward to hearing from you next time. It was a lot of fun. Thanks, Brian. Take care, Anya. Um, thank you, everybody, for your great questions and for your great thoughts. Um, I, I think we have a lot, of, a lot in our minds right now. Uh, if you'd like to keep talking about this, uh, you just got Anya's uh, uh, Twitter account, and you can also tweet at me, Brian Alexander, or at Shindig Events. Use the hashtag FTTE, or you can head to my blog, brianalexander.org, to uh, learn still more. Uh, if you'd like to dive into the past, into our previous sessions on COVID, uh, we have quite a bit, uh, as well as course sessions on teaching and learning. So just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive to learn more. Now, if you'd like to look at our future sessions, we have a whole bunch of topics coming up. Just go to forum.futureofeducation.us. And if you have something that you'd like to share, that you'd like me to share with all of you, please drop me a note, and I'd be glad to do that. Now, uh, with all of that, thank you all for being with us this week. I, I really was resonant. I res on your statement about the importance of the online community really resonated with me here. It's been a pleasure to do this work with all of you. Please, everybody, take care, be safe, and we'll see you next time online. Bye-bye. <laughs>